more than any other nation, America has given its citizens the freedom to shape their religious lives as they see fit. Centuries ago in Europe, religion was largely controlled by popes and potentates. But America has taken a more open approach that has leveled the playing field, allowing anyone and everyone to play a role in the country's thriving religious life. Millions of people have taken the initiative to start things rolling, creating everything from small groups that meet in their homes to new churches or denominations that have many members. They have also started large religious organizations that work around the globe. America has been home to so many people of faith that it's challenging to pick out 10 of the most influential Christian leaders of the past two and a half centuries. Here's our short list of 10 men and women who had a profound impact on Christianity in America. Jonathan Edwards was a preacher, theologian, and missionary who lived in the decades leading up to the American Revolution. From the pulpit of his church in Northampton, Massachusetts, Edwards helped to lay the groundwork for an event later to be called the First Great Awakening. Edwards preached some 1,200 sermons, but it's the sermon titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that would become the most famous sermon in American history. Men's hands cannot be strong when God rises up. The strongest have no power to resist him, nor can any deliver out of his hands. He is not only able to cast wicked men into hell, but he can most easily do it. If people know anything about Edwards, it centers in the hands of an angry God. And I do think that that's a stereotype in the sense that Edwards spoke about the love of God for Christians uh, more than he talked about the judgment of God. On the other hand, he believes in a vengeful, wrathful God against sin and, and sinners. He believes in hell which is a disputed issue today among evangelicals. Edwards is very clear about this. People who have not come to Christ for the forgiveness of sins, they go to hell. That, I think, reflects the way in which uh, Edwards was a, was a traditional reformed pastor and theologian. Um, but if that's all we know about Edwards, then I think we've really missed the core of his message. Edwards' powerful preaching paved the way for the Great Awakening that would sweep through many of the American colonies. But he was more than a passionate preacher. He was also a theologian who wrote books about original sin, justification, and free will that were popular in America and England. In 1758, Edwards was named the president of Princeton College but he died from a smallpox inoculation before he could assume the post. A lot of his relevance has to do with the way that he tried to tie an older Puritan system, an older system of thought uh, going back to the Reformation, and make it relevant to the new enlightenment of the 18th century. In other words, Edwards is able to bring these older theological traditions and ideas into a more modern world. Jonathan Edwards is one of the, the great individuals in the early history of Christianity in American history. He was, on the one hand, a, a active and effective promoter of revivals, and so very much concerned about the, the doing of Christian faith. He was also a very effective Bible student and communicator of deep Christian truths to the living of the Christian life. We could say al almost a mystical devotion to God. And he was a brilliant intellect who uh, defined critical issues coming out of the Enlightenment that needed to be addressed in Christian terms and did so with such a skill that historians in our own day, even sometimes who aren't Christian, learn a great deal from paying close attention to Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is the single most influential theologian in all of American history. Ever since the 18th century, the modern evangelical movement has been intentionally interdenominational, international, interconfessional, 
So when we talk about the long range significance of Jonathan Edwards and compare it, say, to the long range significance of a John Calvin or a Martin Luther, who have uh, denominational traditions that are still very much devoted to their theology. We have to talk about Edwards' significance in slightly different ways. Edwards combined Orthodox Protestantism and this new model evangelical way of doing business across the old boundaries. You need to invite Jesus into your heart. We'll help you to do it exactly according to what scripture says. Get out of your seat, bring a friend, bring your stuff. Let's stand and welcome them. No one leaves. If you've ever seen a church that features altar calls, you can understand Charles Finney, a Presbyterian preacher who is known as the father of modern revivalism. He perfected many of the techniques designed to move people out of the pews and down to the altar where they could give their lives to God. Charles Finney is probably the most famous evangelical of 19th century America. He was a leading revivalist in a period of time when revivalism was the leading institution that was driving the development of evangelicalism. It was as I am that Christ died for me. It was as a sinner that God loved me and loves me still. As a sinner then, I will go to Jesus as I am, as a humble penitent, seeking but not deserving sinner. Will you come? Will you come now? Will you believe now or make God a liar? In the 1820s, Finney was a successful preacher at revivals in New York City, Philadelphia, and Boston. Along the way, Finney popularized a number of techniques like lengthy evangelistic meetings and invitations for sinners to come forward to reflect on the state of their souls. At Finney's revivals, sinners flocked to the anxious bench, which was a row of seats up front near the altar where people could pray, weep, and confess their sins before accepting Christ's salvation. As compared to theological leaders of the First Great Awakening, such as Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and John Wesley, uh, Charles Grandison Finney talked about the revivals of the Second Great Awakening in a slightly different way. Jonathan Edwards, for example, in the 18th century, very famously referred to revivals as surprising works of God, works that can't be generated, fabricated by human means. Charles Finney, of course, still believed that God and his agency was necessary in revivals, but Finney liked to describe revivals as things that we can make happen. Revivals happen when you use the appropriate means and pray and work to make them happen. From the results of this revival, 103 persons have joined this church by profession and 42 by letter. The New York Evangelist. Finney did more than save souls. He also worked to change the world. He allowed women to pray in public at his meetings, which got him into trouble with established Christian leaders. He was a vocal supporter of temperance and he preached against slavery. He also served as the president of Oberlin College, a progressive Christian school that admitted women. But Finney will always be remembered for the new measures he introduced to breathe fresh life into churches and bring people to faith. As he wrote in his book, Lectures on Revivals of Religion. A revival presupposes that the church is sunk down in a backslidden state and revival consists in the return of the church from her backslidings and the conversion of sinners. Finney's legacy was to bequeath a whole set of practices to the broad spectrum of evangelical churches in the United States. Things like preaching for a decision, things like asking people to make a, a commitment to Christ at the end of a meeting had been very rarely done before Finney's time, and he became a master of, of this sort of activity. He was an organizer, he was, he was a zealous person, he wanted to see the gospel penetrate all aspects of life, and these have been characteristics that have been quite prominent since his time in American, especially American Protestant history. Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin was a best-selling novel that confronted many with the horrors of slavery 
and profoundly influenced the direction of American history. The book was published in 1852 and became a powerful recruiting tool for the abolitionist movement, a major factor that brought about the Civil War that broke out between the North and the South less than a decade later. Uncle Tom's Cabin is a critique of slavery. It tries to forward a view of African Americans as essentially human beings. What Harriet Beecher Stowe is trying to do here is one, engage in a criticism of the institution of slavery, but two, she creates Uncle Tom as a kind of Christ-like redemptive figure who suffers at the hand of his white master, Simon Legree, and he is brutally beaten. However, in many ways, Uncle Tom is able to maintain a certain degree of agency because of his higher allegiance to God and his refusal, for example, to beat his fellow innocent slaves, even though he's commanded by his earthly master, Simon Legree, to do so. The legacy is much more ambiguous in terms of both how it has affected American society and race relations, and for that matter, American churches. The pejorative use of the, the term Uncle Tom, it seemed to have emerged prior to the First World War, where a number of African Americans would refer to other African Americans as Uncle Tomish or Uncle Tom figures if they were servile, if they did not demand their full political and civil rights. So the term became a term of opprobrium or a term of abuse, a pejorative term. At least Harriet Beecher Stowe tried to em embody in its fullness what it meant to be a Christian who at least elicited a kind of sympathy on the part of whites. Whether or not she succeeded in terms of attacking broader images of racism and stereotypical images of black is a question that remains sort of hanging over the novel in many regards. Stowe was one of nine children born into one of America's most influential Christian families. Her father was Lyman Beecher, a pastor in congregational and Presbyterian churches who combined preaching politics, and social activism. Her brother, Henry Ward Beecher, was a congregational preacher and writer who became the most famous preacher of the 19th century. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote 30 more books during her life, but none would have the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which harnessed the power of fiction to portray the real life horrors suffered by American slaves. In May 1879, thousands of New York City Catholics crowded into downtown Manhattan to witness the dedication of St. Patrick's Cathedral. The not yet complete spires of the Grand Church in the heart of the city were the culmination of the dreams of a man who had died 15 years earlier. John Hughes was an Irish immigrant raised on a farm in County Tyrone who immigrated to Pennsylvania in 1817. He dreamed of becoming a priest, but was considered too poor and unlettered to enter the priesthood. Until the 1830s, Catholics were a tiny minority of the American population and existed largely as outsiders in a Protestant United States. But war, famine, and unrest in Europe brought hundreds of thousands of new Catholic immigrants from Ireland and Germany to America's shores. Unfortunately, they were not well received by their Protestant neighbors, who viewed them as a threat to their freedom and prosperity. Things were changing very, very rapidly. In 1800, just about 1% of the American population were Catholics. Between 1830 and 1860, the Catholic population increased three times as fast as the population in general. Some Protestant business owners refused to hire Catholic workers and the nativist movement agitated for sanctions against Catholic influence. The evangelical revival in the 1830s and into the 1850s had a dimension that made Catholics a particular religious problem. They regarded the leaders, uh, Lyman Beecher, for instance, and Samuel F. B. Morse and others, regarded the coming of the immigrants not as a kind of accidental thing, but as the work of uh, Satan in a way. The Catholic governments of all the European countries that had Catholic rulers, which were providing money to support immigration to the United States. 
It was within this type of atmosphere that John Hughes became the fourth bishop and first archbishop of New York City. But rather than accommodate himself and the people of his diocese to the status of second-class citizens, Hughes aggressively promoted Catholic influence and power and stood up for the rights of Catholics. Hughes was very intelligent, very able, unbelievably energetic, and very forcible. One of the major grievances of newly arrived Catholics was the manner in which American Protestants attempted to use the developing public school system to inculcate Protestant beliefs in the immigrants' children, including the extensive use of the King James Version of the Bible in the classroom. The effort on the part of Catholics to use political influence to gain public support for sectarian education, as it was understood to be by, by non-Catholics, was a, you know, was a stick of dynamite. The conclusion that Hughes came to was the Catholics would have to provide their own schools. He said, I see the day coming when we'll need to establish a school before we establish a church. Hughes' defiant style and staunch defense of Catholic interests garnered him any number of political enemies. His reputation for a keen political mind, combined with his sharp, stylized signature, earned him the nickname, Dagger John. He brings into a different kind of lens of perception this group who were regarded as so foreign and uh, un-American. And it can't be said that he dissipated that by any means but uh, he didn't take it laying down. In recent years, millions of bracelets and bumper stickers have asked the question, what would Jesus do? But this is not a new question. It was first asked over a century ago by a Congregationalist minister from Topeka, Kansas, named Charles Sheldon. Sheldon wanted to apply the gospel to the needs of his community. So he started spending time with students, with the men who labored on the railroads, and with executives who led the biggest companies. His research led to the most famous of his 50 books, In His Steps, which was published in 1897. The book tells the story of Reverend Henry Maxwell, who imagines what might happen if the Christians in his church did nothing without asking that question, what would Jesus do? The answer was nothing short of transformational. Our motto will be, what would Jesus do? Our aim will be to act just as he would if he were here in our places, regardless of immediate results. Charles Sheldon, in his steps. Sheldon did more than write about the problems of his day. He also put his faith into action fighting for the rights of women, blacks, and Jews long before it was popular to do so. But he will probably be remembered most for what he wrote. Protestant theologian Reinhold Niebuhr was one of the most important thinkers of the World War II and Cold War eras. This Missouri-born son of an immigrant pastor in the German Evangelical Synod of North America, part of today's United Church of Christ, was the premier American advocate of an influential school of Christian theology that came to be known as Neo-Orthodoxy. In the early 20th century, America's Protestant churches were split by the fundamentalist modernist controversy that pitted traditionalist, revival-oriented defenders of the Bible against proponents of liberal theology, which endorsed modern critical scholarship of the Bible. Reinhold Niebuhr came of age during this period and gravitated toward the liberal side of the equation. After graduating from Yale Divinity School in 1915, Niebuhr became a successful pastor in Detroit, where he became an outspoken critic of auto magnet Henry Ford's policies backing local unions in their fights to gain better wages and working conditions. 
Reinhold Niebuhr, his trajectory as an individual and as a scholar began with uh, a reaction to liberal Protestantism uh, as a result of the calamity of the First World War. Niebuhr emerged as a voice for that generation who combined a kind of a pessimism regarding human nature, believing that human beings uh, have an original sin uh, that expresses itself as inordinate self-love. And taken in the group context, uh, it means that groups pursue their own individual ideal of the good at all costs. And as Niebuhr's life and career developed, the advent of Hitler in Germany became apparent. Uh, the cost of uh, groups who were pursuing inordinate self-interest became very clear. And Niebuhr was pessimistic uh, as a Christian about what human beings could do, and thus parted company with that aspect of liberal Protestantism. But he is also a pessimistic optimist in his words. And that optimism comes with the belief that notwithstanding our inclination to self-seeking, as a result of original sin. We have, by grace, the ability to affect the world. And by world, uh, very importantly, uh, Niebuhr understood the political world, uh, the cultural world, the world of society. After World War II, Niebuhr became a staunch voice supporting civil rights and one of the nation's leading opponents of communism. America was deeply flawed, but in Niebuhr's estimation, it provided the best way forward for an unjust, and violent world. It's those qualities, I think, that make him particularly germane to our time and that's captured the attention not only of academic theologians, but of political leaders as diverse as uh, President Obama. Those who are convinced in this, uh, this stage of the 21st century, after 9-11, uh, that uh, pessimism is an appropriate response uh, to the belief in inevitable progress of human nature and its institutions, uh, but don't want to fall into a cynicism. Uh, about what we're able to do, and that feel uh, for uh, reasons of religious faith or perhaps humanistic faith, that we have to pursue in hope the possibility of doing good in this world. From the mid-1940s until his death in 1971, Reinhold Niebuhr became the most easily identifiable Christian voice in the sphere of America's public discourse influencing the thoughts of America's elite shapers of opinion, from pastors to journalists to statesmen. Man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but man's inclination toward injustice makes democracy necessary. I think his legacy for both Christian and non-Christian members of our society consists on reflecting on both of those dimensions. As a socialist, Dorothy Day agreed with Karl Marx's statement that religion was the opiate of the masses. Day felt certain that socialism held the key to bringing about justice. On the other hand, Christianity seemed committed to maintaining the existing social order. After living a wild bohemian youth, Dorothy converted to Catholicism at the age of 30 and founded the Catholic Worker Movement in New York City. When she was living in Greenwich Village and living her bohemian life, she would often find herself sneaking into church after staying out all night. And her friends didn't understand this because most um, of the left in the 20s was just sort of anti-church. She wanted Jesus and the way Jesus lived to make a difference in her life. She couldn't give up her, her radical beliefs. She still believed all of that. She did not leave socialism, did not leave her concern for the plight of the poor because she was Catholic. But she didn't see the church doing anything. They were doing this kind of top-down charity. And she didn't think that was the way to be. They started with a newspaper, May 1st, 1933, and before you know it, people were saying, well, yes, you're talking about feeding the poor. Are you doing it? And they found themselves having soup lines, asking people to live with them. And so the Catholic Worker newspaper became the Catholic Worker Movement. The Catholic Worker Movement applied Day's radical faith to the social problems of the day. She saw Jesus as a nonviolent Jesus. She said that you absolutely cannot have the Ten Commandments, you cannot say thou shalt not kill and have war. So from the get-go, she was a pacifist. 
She picketed companies that engaged in unfair labor practices and protested America's entry into World War II, which led to her being investigated by the FBI. Don't call me a saint, she always said. Well, I think she is a saint. She's a saint because I think she changed the way a lot of people in America look at um, Christianity and how they should live it. She felt she needed to live the words of Jesus and she was able to do it. She didn't compromise. And that to me has always been, been thrilling. For centuries, Christians were told to crucify their selfish egos and concerns. For some, that view began to change in 1952 when a Reformed Church in America minister named Norman Vincent Peale combined Christianity with psychology in a book titled, The Power of Positive Thinking. It became one of the best-selling books of the century. Norman Vincent Peale was born at the end of the 19th century and raised in an Ohio Methodist family. Ordained to the Methodist ministry in the early 1920s, he became the pastor of New York City's Marble Collegiate Church in 1932. With Peel at the helm, this affluent congregation grew from several hundred to over 5,000 members during his half century in the pulpit. Peel, who had struggled with insecurities as a youth, saw Christianity as a pathway to self-esteem. As we pray, great things can happen. But first, become quiet in mind so that God's answer may come through. Let go all ill will and resentment, all negativism. Sincerely hold your problem up to God, let it go, and put it in His hands. Nora and Vincent Peale came along at a moment when the urban churches in America were demoralized, when middle-class people didn't find much for themselves in it or great suburban moves that are leaving the little customary pattern that you'd had. And religion was getting the reputation, including in Christianity, of being hangdog and uh, down in the dumps and pessimistic and gloomy. And uh, Norman Vincent Peale, for all his faults, and he had faults, came on and told people that the gospel of God should not be afraid of modern psychology and modern learning. It should bring them together. His word was positive thinking. And an awful lot of therapy in the churches came about because of people like Peel who said, I'm gonna work with psychiatry, I'm gonna work with psychology, I'm gonna work with social uh, workers, etc., and bring out the positive side of life and motivate people toward it. Peel's books are still popular and Guidepost magazine, which he founded in 1942, remains the most widely circulated religious magazine in America. But Peel's greatest impact was the way in which he helped introduce a new therapeutic model of Christianity, which influenced some of the better known Christian leaders of the 20th century. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. Yes. Martin Luther King Jr.'s resounding voice and righteous zeal made him one of the most influential figures of the 1950s and 60s. In 1963, King held much of a nation spellbound with his I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court had declared segregation in public schools unconstitutional. That same year, King was called to pastor the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. The following year, Rosa Parks ignited the Montgomery bus boycott. King found himself at the center of a nationwide struggle for civil rights, and he gave his life for the cause when he was gunned down in 1968. He was killed one day after delivering another passionate speech. <laughs> 
people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing anything. King challenged the status quo. In other words, King wasn't simply criticizing churches for practicing segregation within the churches, but he was also criticizing Christians for failing to live up to what he perceived to be the demands of Christianity, breaking down the walls of segregation, treating their fellow African-American human beings as equals, and even things such as residential segregation as it existed, for example, in the North. There were a number of Catholics who were deeply angered when King came to Chicago in 1966 and thereafter to talk about segregated schools, inadequate education, residential segregation, and so on. And so when King started talking about these things, this was a fundamental challenge to the way American society itself existed at this time. King's tombstone is inscribed with the words of the old African-American spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God. Many of you must decide this afternoon before you leave here, every person here will decide one way or the other about your relationship to God. Some of you need to rededicate your life. Billy Graham rose from humble beginnings to preach the gospel to some 200 million people in some 180 countries of the world, more than any other man in history. Graham was born into a conservative Presbyterian faith but he transcended the narrow confines of fundamentalism to become the dominant leader of the emerging evangelical movement. A religious revival has taken over the Houston Astrodome home of baseball and football as Billy Graham welcomes President Johnson to his crusade for Christ. Billy Graham is the most famous Christian evangelist of our generation. There have throughout American history been a number of very famous preachers. Uh, Billy Sunday, uh, George Whitfield, Billy Graham very much fits within that tradition and since the 1940s really has been uh, the most prominent Protestant speaker. Uh, some have said he is really the Protestant Pope of the last 50 years. Billy Graham is able to reconnect Americans with his plain folk past, uh, bring a certain sense of assurance, uh, a confident evangelicalism that's perfect for that moment of crisis. Post-World War II, we see the rise of communism, the Cold War, the nuclear threat. There's a lot of anxiety at that moment, and Graham is able to uh, kind of uh, reconnect Americans with a simpler past uh, and with, with an evangelicalism that uh, is, is kind of plain folk, grounded at the small town level, uh, but also forward-looking. And Graham articulates a new vision for evangelicalism that's more inclusive, uh, racially more inclusive than his own past. It takes advantage of new technologies, it takes advantage of uh, kind of a rising suburban middle class. And so Graham is kind of the juncture between the Old South and the New South. Billy Graham helped found the National Association of Evangelicals, Christianity Today magazine, and many other key evangelical organizations. Graham prayed with 11 consecutive American presidents, but in his public ministry, he steered clear of divisive issues choosing instead to focus on preaching the gospel. While these many people are coming here, bow your head. Say yes to Christ. Let him come into your life and make you a new person. Change the whole direction of your life. You can do it right now. God bless you.